Okay, it's 6.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, okay. uh, thank you, Nita, for handing those out. Uh, those will be, um, you won't need it for in the seminar, but it's something we're going to talk about, uh, so it's for your own use afterwards. Uh, but welcome uh, to our second seminar in our series on evaluating the news. And uh, so last week we did a, a very brief history of news, as it were. Um, talked about how it's evolved over time, how information being shared has changed. Uh, and uh, we got into talking about the concept of news media. We talked about fact versus opinion. We looked at some major uh, news media websites to see what do they look like? How do they organize their information? Uh, so before we begin, uh, think about what makes a source seem credible to you. you know, what are your criteria for a source to be credible? Uh, does a person's appearance or voice matter? Mm -hmm. And we'd like, we'd like to say, well, no, but yes, it does. Right? Um, what about their word choice and use of language? The way they right? that, that's That affects how you view them, yeah. Uh, are there particular professions that are credible? Well, well, well I, am, I am happy to report that across the United States, Pew Research has said that librarians are the most trusted <laughs> profession. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> can you independently verify what is said? That's, no. that's an, important, uh, an important thing to consider. Um, now think about people you know personally. So not just a source out there, but people that you know. What are they credible sources for and why? When they share something with you, what do you consider trustworthy? Um, everything, nothing, um, you know, the things that they share. And how do we trust something we haven't personally seen? Now last week we got a little bit into the nature of truth, a little bit philosophical there. Um, and so we have to think about, well, how is it that we trust uh, in things we, we haven't seen before? Um, we've never been to the moon. Um, has anyone here been to Antarctica? Just want to ask first. Right? <laughs> no? <laughs> um, what are the ways that we verify for ourselves that information we've pre been presented is, in fact, factual? And so, for example, how do we go about affirming to ourselves the existence of other places on the planet or something like the presence of atoms? Does anyone happen to have a scanning electron microscope? <laughs> if you do, I want to know where you got it because those are expensive. Um, you know, there, are, there are plenty of things that are, are outside of our normal personal experience. And so we are getting information all the time. And how we interact with that information and how we decide to believe it or not is, is something that's very important. So today's topics for discussion uh, is first we're going to talk about what is logic uh, and by corollary what is a fallacy and how can something make logical sense but still be untrue um, and that's an important point uh, that, that we'll get to. Um, what is partisanship and how does it relate to news? What is propaganda and how is it different from news? And why is it called a news story? And what does that mean for our understanding of an event? So these are the broad topics we're going to look at today. So diving right in, logic, first of all, is a formal school of mathematics. Did anybody take logic courses? Did you enjoy them? That's how I got on my math requirements. OK, all right. Um, I, I certainly enjoyed um, I logic. Yeah. Uh, and so it's used to evaluate the validity of both statements and mathematical expressions. So here you see some examples of the way a statement might be structured and then the mathematical shorthand in logic for what that would be. Uh, we're going to take a little bit closer look here. Um, logic considers starting perspective and assumptions, conditional statements, cause and effect, correlation, and other relational aspects of equations and how we use words. So we're getting to our first link today. We're going to go over to the Stanford Plato Institute. And uh, logical form uh, is what we use to evaluate a statement 
for logical validity or consistency. We can look at a statement and say that yes, that statement is valid, meaning it, it makes logical sense mathematically. Um, or we can look at it and say, no, it doesn't. So the top three here are examples of logically valid statements, and the bottom three are not. So let's take a look. John danced if Mary sang, and Mary sang, so John danced. So this is a conditional statement. We know that if Mary sings, then John is going to dance. And because Mary sang, we know that John danced because it's a cause and effect relationship. Every politician is deceitful, and every senator is a politician, so every senator is deceitful. So this is what we call a conditional, in which uh, if A, then B, uh, and if B, then C, and therefore A equals C. Um, the detective is in the garden, so someone is in the garden. So this is going from specificity to generality. This is something that is logically valid. So if I said that you know, I am standing here, then you could say a person is standing here, or some other descriptor that would validly apply to me. Um, but if we look at the bottom three, John danced if Mary sang, and John danced so Mary sang. Why is that not logically? Could there be other conditions in which John might dance? We don't have John danced if and only if Mary sang, right? We know that if she sings, he'll dance, but he could dance under other circumstances. So it does not follow just because he danced that Mary sang. Every feathered biped is a bird, and Tweety is a feathered biped, so Tweety can fly. Why is that not? Uh, why is that not valid? It's missing the fact that birds can fly. Can so fly? it's going on the assumption that assumption all birds, that can, birds fly. can fly. So yeah. it's starting with a false assumption, the false assumption being all birds fly. But we know that there are plenty of birds that do not fly. Um, every human born before 1879 died, so every human will die. <laughs> so why is, this, why is this logically invalid? because it's creating a causal relationship where none exists. People will die, but it has nothing to do with the year 1879 or the people that died before that point. Uh, they are completely unrelated, but it's trying to say that one is related to the other. It's creating a false correlation. So these are examples of the type of logical statements that uh, mathematicians and, and other uh, fields will use to try to evaluate if something makes sense. But it's important to note that just because something is logical doesn't mean that it is true. Um, it merely means that a statement is not contradictory based on given assumptions. So there are a lot of hypothetical situations that make logical sense when they're set up, but they're hypothetical and they are not in the real world, and so that doesn't make them true. It just means that they logically make sense. If the assumptions are incorrect, then even if a statement is logical, it is untrue. We call this internally consistent logic. And so the statements itself uh, relate to each other in a way that is logically valid, but if the assumptions they're operating off of are incorrect, then even though it logically makes sense, it's still not true. Um, and we see this uh, quite regularly um, in uh, news media, and um, we'll look at that in a, in a bit more detail. Can anyone think of any examples of this? Anything they've heard or read or seen recently where something makes logical sense on its own, but when you give it a context, remember last week we talked about how facts have context. Um, if you give it a context, then it doesn't make sense anymore. No? Well, we'll move forward and we'll see if you can think of any as, as we uh, introduce other things. So, fallacies. Fallacies are statements that can appear logical or that make sense 
maybe intuitively, by gut feeling, something like that, but they are incorrect or wrong, invalid or irrelevant. They are used for political persuasion all the time. Um, I have a hard time watching political debates because it's like fallacies left and right and it, that has nothing to do with creating a policy. So, um, even though logic and the identification of fallacies has been around for literally millennia, people still fall for fallacies. Why? Like the, the identification of fallacies has, has been around for over 2,000 years. Um, some fallacies have names in Latin, right? Uh, why do people still fall for them? Hmm? They want to. They want to, okay. If, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, confirmation bias a little bit, um, is if it makes sense to them, and they don't have to think hard about it, it makes them feel comfortable, then they can go along with it. Why else might, might people fall for balance? It follows what they feel. It follows what they feel, yep, yeah, along that same vein. Because they work, as long as you don't think about them too deeply or recognize them for what they are. Um, it's that thinking deeply part, remembering to go back and think about it again Last week we talked about metacognitive thinking, the ability to think about what you're thinking about, to recognize what your own thoughts and feelings are, and then to be able to evaluate those thoughts and feelings um, and understand how you are responding to the stimuli around you. So we're gonna look at some of the most common and these are gonna be on your sheet. Uh, and so this time we're gonna go over to the Purdue Owl Writing Lab, they, they have uh, wonderful resources. Okay. okay, so the first fallacy we want to talk about is the slippery slope. Slippery slope preys on fear. It's uh, if A happens, then B could happen. And if B happens, C could happen. If C could happen, then D could happen, all the way down to Z. So therefore, if A happens, Z is going to happen. Um, well, the problem is, is that you've created this long chain of conditionals, and it doesn't necessarily follow that Z is going to happen. Um, is it possible that it could happen? Yes. But does it mean that it will happen? No. Hasty generalizations. Um, if you, you've had a child or, or a teenager that um, has said, oh, this trip's gonna be so boring, or something to that effect, um, then you have seen the hasty generalization, um, which is evaluating something or someone based on a short amount of data. Whether it's one conversation or trying to make a generalization about a population based on a small sample. Um, hasty generalizations um, can cause a lot of problems, uh, especially when, you know, governmental decisions are made off of those. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. Um, because B happened after A, B must have been caused by A. Um, and that's not necessarily true. Um, the example they give here is I drank bottled water and now I am sick, so the water must have made me sick. And they say it could have been caused by that burrito last night or a flu bug that's been going through for a couple days, or maybe there was a chemical spill somewhere. There are other reasons that B could have happened. Um, it's possible that A could be the reason, but you have to evaluate it. You have to think it through and look at all of the evidence. Genetic fallacy. Um, so this one is, is really um, sinister. Um, it's saying that because of the origins of a person or idea, that person or idea is bad. Um, you see this all the time, right? Um, it's because it's coming from them, it's not good, right? Or because those people say it's good, it must be bad, right? Evaluate an idea on its own merits. I, I can't say that enough. If an idea is good, it's a good idea. But you won't know unless you take the time to think it through. Begging the claim. Uh, 
you take an idea that you want to prove and you put an assumption that it is proved into you trying to prove the idea. Uh, and so this uses very emotional, descriptive language. Um, so you see, filthy and polluting coal should be banned. Right? You know the speaker's opinion right away. Right? Should coal be banned? Possibly, right? Um, but not because they said it this way. You know, give me actual good reasons why it should be banned, and, and how are you going to go about that ban, um, and, and so on. Circular argument. A um, little bit dated here, but George Bush is a good communicator because he speaks effectively. So in other words, you are just restating your idea in another way to try to say that you've proved your point. I'm good at swimming because I'm a good swimmer. Right? So, but uh, it, it happens. Now, now this seems very simplistic because it's a simple sentence, but when you're looking for a circular argument, it usually involves a lot of talking um, in which they go around and around um, and it takes a while for you to sift through that and say, well, they didn't actually say anything. Either or. Um, we unfortunately have seen this a lot in the last seven years, I would say, um, which is where people are giving a very dramatic, it's either this or it's this and there's nothing in between if you're not for this, then you are for this. If you're not for that, then you are for this. Um, and it's ignoring all the complexities of any issue in real life that we deal with. It's reductionist, and it doesn't help. Politicians love this next one, ad hominem attacks, which is instead of dealing with the merit of an idea or its not usefulness, they attack the person sharing the idea. Um, well, you're not a scientist, so I don't even have to listen to what you have to say. Or, um, you know, you don't have a degree from a university, so your opinion doesn't matter. Or, uh, it's usually taken in one of two directions. Either from a position of, I have authority and you don't, or I have moral superiority and you don't. Um, you did this bad thing 20 years ago, so it doesn't matter what this idea you're sharing now is. Um, ad hominem attacks are never helpful for a discussion of ideas. Okay, we are seeing this next one a lot as well, uh, ad populum, which is using societal pressure, peer pressure, um, guilt tripping in a way to try to say, if you were really part of the group, or a good person, or whatever you will, you would believe this. And because there's all of us in this group that believe this thing, then we must be right. Uh, the majority isn't necessarily right. Um, History has shown that many times. Um, and the majority doesn't always want what's right. Um, that doesn't, you know, just because they're majority doesn't mean that they are right. The red herring. jumping from one issue to another to avoid talking about the issue. Uh, and and uh, politicians enjoy this one as well. Is Yes, they're bringing up a valid point about something that's important to talk about, but we were talking about this, and this is what we wanted to know about. Um, press secretaries for the White House seem to do this quite a bit. It doesn't matter which president it's for. They do this a lot. The straw man, uh, you take an opponent's viewpoint, you take one point out of that viewpoint, all of the different questions and complexities and ideas, and you take one idea, and then you say that you've defeated their entire viewpoint by trying to disprove that one point. Uh, again, it's a reductionist argument. You're taking away from the complexities of real life. You are trivializing other people's thoughts and opinions and ideas, concerns and questions. Uh, so it's, it's not helpful. 
Now this last one, we, we really saw quite a bit um, during the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, moral equivalence, um, equating one action with another action that should not be compared. So at CNN, uh, we've got some headlines here. Um, let's see. Um, okay, the Justice Department announces the first sedition charges, a watershed moment that raises the stakes significantly. So, information, but then they are evaluating that information for possible effect, right? So we know that this is gonna go somewhere, so let's take a look and see if we can spot any fallacies. Okay. <coughs> the Justice Department on Thursday announced the first sedition charges related to the January 6th insurrection, a watershed moment in the year-long investigation. The case resolves around the Oath Keepers, a far-right extremist group, and its leader, Stuart Rhodes. Many of the defendants were already facing charges for storming the U.S. Capitol building and deny wrongdoing. But the new indictment raises the stakes significantly and made public new details about their alleged plans for violence. Attorney General Merrick Garland had balked at the earlier efforts to bring the seditious conspiracy charge, but in the months since, people briefed on the matter say FBI investigators and D.C. federal prosecutors have spent much time building the case, at least in part with the help of cooperators and the benefit of internal communications among the Oath Keepers. Here are the key takeaways. Any fallacies so far? I spotted three. Which just goes to show how easy it is to fall for them, right? Okay, so remember, we talked about logical, internal logical consistency. And last week we talked about how what a person does not say tells you a lot about who they think they're talking to. They make assumptions about their audience. And you can notice those cues based on some of the words they use because they assume that you understand the words and that you agree with the adjectives that they use. Right? So, uh, and last week we talked about after reading a headline and or reading a statement and then reading it again, did your ideas about it change? And for, for many people that was the case after reading it more than once. And so if you read through it again, tell me what you think. Well, I'm not sure what they're talking about, being a watershed. Okay, being a watershed moment. So right there, um, <coughs> they are projecting something, right? They are assigning this event an amount of significance that they assume that you will agree that this is a significant thing to happen. Right? Um, if I'm a cocoa farmer in Africa, will I care? No, right? Um, and so we're learning a little bit about this person's point of view based on the words they use. Uh, so, the case resolves around the Oath Keepers, a far-right extremist group. So that's a label, right? Yeah. It may be correct, but it is obvious that they are assuming certain characteristics of that group to make you say these are bad people, right? Um, many of the defendants were already facing charges for storming the U.S. Capitol building, right? Um, but the new indictment raises the stakes significantly and made public new details about their alleged plans for violence. Um, can you be prosecuted for a crime you didn't commit? No. No. It, most of the time, no. Right, Carl? <laughs> there are some exceptions. There are some exceptions, um, you know, uh, planning to commit a terrorist act and things like that. So, depending on what those alleged plans are, it might be relevant, but if not, then that is immaterial, right? But it depends on what else they have to say. Let's, let's continue. Federal prosecutors have been slammed by legal experts, Democratic lawmakers, Donald Trump critics, and media pundits for going easy on the rioters. That criticism has now been answered in a big way with the charges of seditious conspiracy. Garland said in a major speech last week that prosecutors would go after the January 6 perpetrators at any level, whether they were present that day or were otherwise criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. 
Thursday's indictment puts some meat on the bones. Sedition is difficult to prove in court, and an indictment is only the very beginning of a legal case. There are many hoops that prosecutors will need to jump through before they win convictions, but this is a critical first step. What do you see? Sensationalism, absolutely. It's an assumption that uh, the prosecutors, that it's a good thing for the prosecutors to get to the end of this um, case. Very good, no very good, yep. Um, before they win convictions, right? Um, let's see. Criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. Um, so this is something that I see in the news a lot late, lately, um, in the last uh, five years, I would say, the threat to our democracy. Now, we did a series on the Constitution back in October and November. Is the United States a democracy? No, we're a republic, and that's a big difference. And so the idea of constantly using this word democracy changes the perception of the way the government is organized. Um, and how people should respond to events and what they can do to respond to those events. Um, so it's something to think about. It destroys once and for all the talking point from those downplaying the events of January 6th that the attack on the Capitol wasn't an insurrection because nobody has been charged with sedition. Okay, that is a great paragraph for fallacies. What have we got there? You see a hasty generalization here? Okay. And then we also see that um, post hoc ergo, oh, Latin. But uh, because A preceded B and we have B, therefore A caused B. Um, so because people have been charged with sedition, then that means that it was an insurrection. Yeah. You know, people get charged with things all the time. That doesn't mean anything until it's proven in court. And so, um, we see it going. All right, so, CNN. Ooh. Now, let's take a look at Fox News. Bunny rabbits and ice cream. Saki goes off script after being asked if the White House thinks things are going pretty poorly. Okay. Okay. Saki gets sarcastic on bitter day. White House could just do bunny rabbits and ice cream. Confronted with setbacks, press secretary says the White House is not a place to try easy things. So, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki deployed a colorful bit of sarcasm Thursday in response to a question regarding the setbacks that continue to pile up for the Biden administration. It was a bitter day for the White House that saw the Supreme Court block President Biden's corporate vaccine mandate and moderate Democrat senators reject a change rule who don't agree with the White House, who are concerned about things that the White House isn't doing, that their, um, that their concerns are trivial, right? That they amount to bunny rabbits and ice cream. All right, so um, Supreme Court blocks Biden virus mandate for big employers. That's the big headline. Uh, virus cases slow in some cities, but U.S. isn't out of the woods. Oath Keepers leader charged with seditious conspiracy in January 6th inquiry. Okay, that's interesting. So that headline is different. From the CNN article, did it tell who in that organization was being charged? No. No. But here, um, the, the New York Times headline specifically tells us that Oath Keepers leader charged, just one person. The CNN article didn't sound like it was just one person, did it? Right? Okay. Cinema opposes changes to filibuster and blow to Bowdoin, Biden <laughs> voting rights push. Uh, the RNC is preparing to require presidential candidates to skip debates run by the long-established commission. Let's look at that one. Okay. Oh, we can't. Because we have to pay money to access their content. 
We're going to talk about gatekeepers and censorship in a later <laughs> seminar. Um, <laughs> uh, but, okay, will we be able to look at any articles? Let's see. No, they won't. Okay, so there's the New York Times for you. Apparently, they're hard up for money. Okay. <laughs> so, um, looking at the things we did, so uh, you know, assumptions, emotional language. We found we did find some fallacies. Um, how does this affect the way you you read those articles? Does it make you more skeptical, more cynical? Yeah. Um, if they have an obvious bias, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're going to be more skeptical. If it's so obvious. If it's so obvious, yeah, right? It depends if the bias is in what you believe in. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. If, it, if it's along well, your line of thinking, you say, darn right. <laughs> right. If it's the opposite, then it's like, oh, it's like, <laughs> right. And, and so, so that's why, you know, the, for news literacy, which is the point of, of this seminar series, um, you know, that ability to stop and think, both in the moment and later, and evaluate, well, why am I reacting this way to what I'm reading or seeing or hearing? And how is that affecting the way that I'm choosing to address this issue? Or the way I feel about other people if their opinions differ from mine? Okay. Um, does the use of fallacies affect your view of the author or the stated viewpoint? Well, I think in a more general way, you know, Vince is exactly right about the making sure with what the uh, gist of the article is about. But I think you can be skeptical of a lot of that kind of news, like CNN or Fox, regardless of your position. You may, you know, think underlying what they're trying to get at is it's okay, but the way they present it, you can be skeptical of that, regardless of what position you have. Okay. So again, that, that goes back to some of the fallacies we looked at, is that maybe it's not the idea or the topic that we shouldn't pay attention to, but the way that people are trying to present it to us might be a problem. Um, and we're going to take a look at that tonight. Why did these news media companies employ fallacies in their articles? Hmm? It sells. Right? Yeah. Um, there are a number of words that you see a lot of times in headlines for news media um, and also on YouTube clips related to news media uh, that uh, if I see those words used, I automatically know that this is a very biased piece of information. Um, I may read it just to see, well, what is it that their point of view is trying to say? Um, but I will know that they're not going to give an objective view of anything. If I see the words slammed or here's what you need to know um, or uh, we'll, we'll see a few more as, as, as we go through the, the series. But um, whenever I see that, I, I know I'm in for a ride. Um, so what were the articles we looked at speaking about? So the first article we looked at from CNN was talking about how the FBI has brought charges against, well, they should have told us that it was against one person, but it sounded like it was against a group of people um, in relation to January 6th in, in 2020. Uh, the second article we looked at on Fox News was talking about one sarcastic comment made by the White House press secretary today. Um, and so you can see that, but both of those were big headline news, um, supposedly. Um, so think about that. Were either of those articles persuasive in nature, at least in, in the way that they were written? No, not, not um, explicitly, right? Right, is, is, is they weren't explicitly trying to persuade you to a viewpoint, oh, right. but the assumptions that they made, the types of word that they used, were obviously trying to get you to move in a certain direction of thinking. 
were either of them against something? Right? Um, you could clearly tell what their viewpoint was. Okay, so in that case, we're going to move on to partisanship. So it comes from partisan, from French, meaning a person who is part of a division or faction, especially whose judgment is clouded by prejudiced adherence to the party. So instead of thinking for themselves, they say, because this is what the group believes, this is what I will believe and do. Okay? Um, us versus them. We're right and you're wrong. Me, you, us, them, right, wrong, good, evil, self, other. Partisanship promotes fragmentation. It enables miscommunication and cutting off communication entirely. We can't talk to them. Right? It encourages the creation of echo chambers. Some of you have maybe heard this word, uh, this phrase used in the last couple years. Um, what, what do you uh, provisionally think uh, the definition for an echo chamber would be? You hear yourself saying the same. I mean, everybody's talking to the same way. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're repeating everything. Right. So an echo chamber is all the voices coming back to you are the same things that you said. Okay. You are cutting yourself off from the ex exposure of new or different ideas. You have put yourself in a bubble in which everything is the same. I don't know about you, but that sounds really boring. Um, and this plays into that idea of confirmation bias. Is because these people have similar views to me, then I can trust what they say. That's a fallacy, <laughs> right? Everybody believes this. Everybody believes this. It stereotypes and dehumanizes the other, yep. right? You are reducing other people to a categorization. It's unhealthy, uh, literally unhealthy for you mentally and physically, uh, and it leads to the justification of violence. It leads to distrust, fear, and more easily emotional persuasion and it predicts the use of propaganda. Because if you are already partisan, then it's really easy to agree with propaganda. When news becomes partisan, it ceases to be news, and it becomes propaganda. I'll say that one more time. When news becomes partisan, it ceases to be news and becomes propaganda. If it's not sharing information and instead is trying to get you to follow an opinion, that's not information anymore. That's persuasion. And that's what propaganda is for. Now, it's important to note that propaganda wasn't always a dirty word. Okay? Um, it originally just meant material or information shared or spread for a common purpose or cause. You know, the verb to propagate, right? You're spreading information, right? Um, but when we get to World War I, that's when the modern meaning really starts. So here we have uh, one of those wonderful World War I propaganda posters. Destroy this mad brute, enlist. Um, so we have a very stylized damsel in distress in the hen hands of this uh, gorilla-like figure wearing a German World War I helmet. Um, with the word yeah, an enlist down there. So using this visual imagery and word choice to try to persuade you to think a certain way. Um, and political propaganda always begins from a position of authority or trust, right? Either from the person who's in charge or from someone who you agree with and you look to for information. It encourages people to distrust other sources. So propaganda says, I'll tell you what's really going on. And why can they do that? Because they claim to be authoritative, intelligent, and a trustworthy source. And they claim special knowledge, privilege, or access to sources. I've got secret information. Okay. And so propaganda discourages examining facts by encouraging you to listen to carefully selected truth-tellers, experts, or authorities. 
Um, now, are there actual people that tell the truth? Yes. Are there people that are expert in a subject or a skill? Absolutely. Are there authorities on subjects or procedures or you know the way something should be done? Yes. But you don't just believe something because of where it's coming from. You believe it because it's true. You evaluate the idea for what it is. And so now we're going to get into the uncomfortable portion of tonight's seminar. Um, still the best examples of propaganda. Um, and we're going to start with Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Party. So they practically invented modern propaganda techniques that utilize media. Uh, and they're still used by communist and dictator-run countries all over the world. And so we're going to have a little how-to guide, uh, courtesy of the Nazi party. Number one, begin taking control of entities that disseminate information, news media, schools, and local government. Number two, Promote your organization's good qualities and achievements in a way that makes people feel part of your success. So make people feel like they belong to the good things you are doing. Number three, unify people around a common belief by using cultural, symbolic, and religious ideas, practices, and imagery. Um, Hitler, unfortunately, was a master at this. Um, you think about the iconography and the visual symbols that he used to get people to do what he told them to. The use of the swastika, uh, the use of the Roman e eagle, uh, the use of certain types of parades and other things that were meant to make people feel like they belonged, that they were part of something that was had a long history and was great and noble, right? Um, identify people's problems and discontent. Create a scapegoat for those problems. Use fallacies and fake news to prove the scapegoat is to blame. Dehumanize the scapegoat by restricting their rights, ostracizing them, and confiscating their property. Normalize violence against the scapegoat by repeating steps three and four and six and seven. Now, you know, we look at this and we read this and there's like, this seems so sinister and it's very sobering, but it is extremely effective. And that's what makes it scary, is that if you have problems and everybody around you is saying, this is the answer, and you get swept up at some event where there's all this pomp and circumstance, it's very easy to get emotionally involved and to stop thinking about what the ideas actually are. Thanks to this, there are volumes of psychological research on the German people and the aftermath of what the Nazis propagated. It did. And one sobering note is that to come up with this, the Nazis studied the Jim Crow South to develop this. And that's a scary, a scary thing to think about, is they came to the United States to figure out how to make this work. Um, I don't know how that makes you feel, um, but, you know, the, and, and we're gonna look at that right now. Because it didn't end with the Nazis. So Mao Zedong, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Great Leap Forward in the 1950s, uh, was supposed to be this time where the Chinese people would rise up and have this great flourishing production of agriculture and industry. Uh, 
um, and the Cultural Revolution was meant to bring forward new ideas and get rid of all the old imperialist thinking. And it resulted in the deaths of 50 million people. Starvation, mob violence, prison camps, and cannibalism. Um, makes Hitler look like a sissy kind of. Um, in terms of overall effect of, of dead, right? Um, but it's a different kind of bad. Because the propaganda that was put out was that everything is fine. Everything is good, everything is wonderful. Why? Because we're the authority and if we say it, it must be true. And so, um, nobody's starving. Production numbers are way up. Uh, and, and no, there was famine and people were starving to the point where there were literally raging bands of cannibals. Um, in parts of Western China. But it didn't stop there. Uh, it continued in North Korea. Does anyone remember in the 1990s in North Korea? The same thing happened. Um, you had cannibals. Um, and yet the state media in North Korea was saying, everything's fine. And it's still happening in Xinjiang in China today. There are literally people being kidnapped from their homes and chain gang forced to pick cotton. Modern slavery right now in China, but everything is fine. Okay. Some familiar names? Fidel Castro, Rafael Trujillo, Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi. You know, in their time, they were freedom fighters, promising power to the people when they win. But that's not what happened, is it? All of them, without exception, became dictators and utilized Hitler's methods. They all led to societies with strict governmental control of news media and education. So survivors of these regimes inevitably compare their upbringing to brainwashing. Um, you have cult of personalities, people forced to have pictures of the great leader in their home. Um, where is the propaganda process to dictatorship happening right now? Does anyone know of any places where it's going on? My big thing is watching what's happening in Iowa where there's Okay. By who wrote them and what they're about. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about censorship at a, a later one and talk about the idea of gatekeeping. That's a very important point, Mignon. Um, yes, Dick? Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, when the statements came out, the Zero Flow Global Media Summit, calling uh, regular news stations false news, to mm -hmm. me that was the beginning and reminded me a lot of the beginnings of some of these because all of a sudden, we were not to trust anybody but what was we said officially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone know who's the president of the Philippines right now? President Duarte? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a name that you've heard. Look at the kind of statements that he's made and the things that he's been doing and you've got this going on right now. Um, we've had, what, three military coups in Africa in the last year, right? Um, you have the, the coup in Burma. Um, China, the Communist Party, you know, they've been doing things for years, but the current president of, of China, Xi Jinping, is once again creating a cult of personality Right? Propaganda, very similar to Mao. So, it works, and it's still being used. And so, we're going to rewind before World War II, we're going to rewind before World War I, where our modern usage of propaganda comes uh, from, and we're going to talk about how news started to change. Um, 
information with an agenda. Why is it called a news story? So Joseph Pulitzer, who you may know from the Pulitzer Prize uh, for, for journalism, which I think is kind of ironic once we get through this, he bought the New York World in 1883. Uh, and in 20 years, he made it the largest newspaper in the country. And how did he do that? Uh, he brought drama to news. And so this is a quote from Paul Weaver. He's a Harvard political scientist who, who studied um, the development of journalism and, and the change of the news in the 1800s. Turning news articles into stories with a plot, actors in conflict, and colorful details. In the late 19th century, most newspaper accounts of government actions were couched in institutional formats, much like the minutes of a board meeting and about as interesting. Pulitzer turned them into stories with a sharp dramatic focus that both implied and aroused intense public interest. Most newspapers of the time looked like the front page of the Wall Street Journal still does. Pulitzer made stories dramatic by adding blaring headlines, big pictures, and eye-catching graphics. His journalism took events out of their dry institutional context and made them emotional rather than rational, immediate rather than considered, and sensational rather than informative. The press became a stage on which the actions of government were a series of dramas. What do you think of the Pulitzer Prize now? <laughs> um, yeah, probably should be renamed. But you know, this is a huge change in the way that people are receiving information about the actions of government. I think this statement right here is real important, both implied and aroused intense public interest. So the aroused public interest based on, you know, eye catching a flash, yes. But he wrote them in such a way that he implied that people were interested about it, right? Think about the assumptions and the wording we saw in some of the, the articles we looked at tonight and how it made it seem like this is a big deal and people are talking about it and thinking about it. And that's the way he wrote it to make you think that other people were thinking it too. And there's our ad populum fallacy, right? Yes, William Randolph Hearst, and we're going to talk about him next week. So, um, <laughs> yeah, last week we talked about uh, the creation of news media, how these companies got together and bought television and newspaper and radio stations to increase their reach and put their fingers in the pie in all the directions, right? Um, news companies across the country, um, a lot of them are all subsidiaries. They are owned by bigger companies. And you, you think about it, uh, if you follow the financial paper trails, um, they're actually owned by not very many people. I've heard of six, is that true? That is, that is pretty accurate. Okay. That is unfortunately pretty accurate. Um, but here's the thing, is that news should not be drama. Um, modern news media companies function to make money. Bottom line, literally. In the 19th century, most newspapers were locally owned, yay journal, uh, and operated and actually shared just the news. Now, that's not to say that they didn't still have bias, that they didn't make assumptions, that there wasn't sensationalism, you know, four-year-old girl grows hairy eyeball on her shoulder, you know, whatever you want it to be. Um, but it wasn't systematic, right? Um, it was local. Sometimes it was for fun. Sometimes it was because there was nothing going on, so they actually wrote a story to entertain people, right? Um, but no, this is something different. This was how can we make more profit by changing the way people perceive information? Drama needs conflict and tension. Remember propaganda points four and five? Right. What are people's problems? And make your scapegoat. Drama needs protagonists and villains. 
So remember partisanship and us versus them. You guys seeing a pattern yet? Um, drama is entertainment. And entertainment can be educational, but that is not its primary purpose. Right? Why do people entertain? They do it for the attention. They do it for the fame. They do it for personal enjoyment. Um, they do it for the money. Um, but the primary purpose of entertainment is not to provide you with information. Right? Now, information can be presented in an entertaining way, um, but you can discern that if you, know, you take the time to think about it and look at it. So entertainment tells a story. It doesn't share information. So Joseph Pulitzer came up with that idea of news as a story. And you hear that all the time. You hear it in movies, right, where there's a reporter of some kind who's looking for the big scoop, the next big story, right? Um, and it's because they're telling a narrative. They're telling a story that has conflict, that has a plot, that has protagonists and villains. And so they've changed the sharing of information into something to entertain you. And in some ways, that can be fun, right? Um, how many of you are familiar with satirical newspapers, such as uh, The Onion and The Babylon Bee, right? Okay, so they write articles that are absolutely ridiculous, but they poke fun in real life and make you ask questions and think. Um, but some people don't like that. Um, Let's take a look at an ancient example. Panem et Circenses. Breads and circuses. So we go back to the Roman Empire, um, and we're looking at uh, the first century AD to about the third century is when this became uh, a policy. And it was a government tool to appease and distract the public from actual societal problems. There was domestic discontent over government policies and inaction. There were places where there was famine. Uh, there were places where there was corruption. There were places where um, there were attacks on the border of the empire. Uh, the empire wasn't taking care of it. People were upset. Um, and so instead of actually dealing with the problem, they said, well, we like our cushy, comfortable position where we are, and so we're going to distract everybody instead. Um, so how do you appease and distract them? Friends and circuses. You provide them handouts and entertainment. Okay. So does that qualify as propaganda? In what way? They're distracting you from your cause. They're giving you something else. I mean, they let you know what you want. So back to, back to points four and five. Identify the people's problems and discontent. Create a scapegoat. Those aren't really your problems. The problem is, is that you're not happy. You have no food. You have no food. You have no fun. So come, uh, come get some food, and then uh, come and watch this, and, and your problems won't matter. Okay? Where do we see this employed in media today? Now, I very specifically put media, not government, because we could talk about government all day long, but we're evaluating the news. Um, how is this employed in media today? So last week we mentioned, um, as we talked about the history of news, we mentioned the creation of news celebrities, of particular news anchors or news personalities um, that you're not watching the news because of the information being shared, you're watching the news because of that person, right? Um, because they're entertaining. You like the way that they talk or the tone of their voice, or um, the type of programs that they have on. Okay. 
Nobody gets a drink of Walter Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's review since we're just about out of time here. Logic helps us identify whether a statement is valid. Does it make sense? But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Okay. Fallacies may seem valid and logical, but they aren't. Partisanship and propaganda go hand in hand. Both thrive on division and othering. Both promote an agenda. Modern news media companies are in many cases agents of propaganda and partisanship. They produce drama masquerading as news. They utilize fallacies and craft stories to sensationalize news events to create revenue. That's depressing. So, who can you trust? In the words of LeVar Burton, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, be news literate. Take control of your own information processing. That's what this seminar is about, is giving you the ability to think and analyze and understand what is being thrown at you so that you can decide for yourself. Ask questions. Do research. And if we want to do a seminar about how to do research, we can do that. So. News media can still be helpful. But remember, apply logic. Identify fallacies and propaganda. Notice what's missing from the story. That's so important is you can t tell a lot by what they don't say. And always check for primary sources that you can access to evaluate for yourself. Because if they just say a bunch of information, but you have no way to independently check it for yourself, it's just hearsay. Right? It's second hand. You want to be able to correlate, especially if they're giving you numbers or a quotation, um, you want to make sure that you can make sure that quotation wasn't taken out of context, right? Or that those numbers weren't skewed in some way or improperly applied. Especially with news media that has opinions similar to yourself. Confirmation bias is a dangerous thing, right? And so um, get in the habit of asking questions and being aware of the thoughts and feelings you have when information gets thrown at you. So that's it for this week. Um, so thanks everybody for coming and I'll hopefully see you next week. Um, so again, thanks. Thank you.